Great. Well, thank you, uh, Larry. I appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation to uh, come. I've been uh, very impressed. Had a chance to tour some of the facilities here in the uh, Prostate Center and this beautiful facility. It sounds like uh, you got things going very well here at, uh, in Vancouver. So it's, uh, it's a great honor to be here, and I, I really appreciate the invita invitation. It was great to be able to interact a little bit with the residents yesterday uh, as well. <clears throat> I thought what I would do this morning is talk a little bit about uh, robotic, uh, robotic surgery for urologic malignancies, which has gone beyond prostatectomy, really, at many centers. And we're now doing uh, robotic partial nephrectomies and robotic uh, cystectomies and lots of different robotic reconstructive procedures. So it's really beyond prostatectomy now. But I thought I'd give you sort of my perspective on some of this and how it's developed. And I don't think the jury is in in every situation about whether robotic surgery is better than open surgery and that debate will continue, but uh, I think as technology improves, we'll be seeing more and more of uh, minimally invasive uh, approaches to urologic cancers. <clears throat> so just as a bit of background, I, you know, this is <clears throat> mostly for some of the residents and medical students, you know, it's, uh, uh, if you look at the number of new cancer cases diagnosed in this, uh, in the United States every year, it counts for about 40, 40% 40 of the new cancers diagnosed are, are urologic cancers, including prostate cancer. Uh, uh, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, testicular cancer accounts for about 40%. Now, a large bulk of that is prostate cancer, obviously, but some people are surprised to know that that, uh, that the number of new cases of cancer in, in the United States is that, uh, is that uh, great. It's also, I, I think, of interest to go back <coughs> and look at the history of the development of surgical treatment for prostate cancer, because this is really where robotic surgery in <coughs> urology originated, was with, <coughs> excuse me, with radical prostatectomy. And Hugh Hampton Young, considered the father of modern urology, uh, first performed a, a perineal prostatectomy, not robotically, a perineal prostatectomy back in 1904. Uh, and uh, Terence Millen from England uh, pioneered the uh, retropubic prostatectomy, and the first one performed in the late 1940s. Uh, what happened subsequent to that, though, was that radical prostatectomy fell out of favor by the 1970s because it was an operation that was associated with a significant amount of uh, blood loss. And, and everybody was uh, impotent, and uh, many were incontinent. So radiation therapy was a preferred uh, form of a treatment for uh, prostate cancer in the 1970s. <clears throat> and it wasn't until, you know, Pat Walls um, allied himself with some others to uh, outline the anatomy, both of the venous anatomy here described, uh, looking at the dorsal venous uh, structure and some of the ways in which uh, the bleeding associated with this procedure could be controlled. <coughs> And this, this obviously made uh, great strides in terms of improving the morbidity of uh, radical prostatectomy. <clears throat> and then further, he uh, described with, uh, with a Donker the pelvic autonomic uh, nervous uh, anatomy. And uh, this was done actually in, in uh, fetal uh, cadavers in the Netherlands. And uh, this pioneering work, uh, identifying the location of the neurovascular bundles, then led to the nerve sparing or anatomic prostatectomy, which again, from 1982 to the present, has improved the popularity of radical prostatectomy so that now it's the most popular and most often selected treatment for prostate cancer. <coughs> now, what about minimally invasive prostatectomy? Well, when I was a resident in 1992 at Duke, <coughs> we, we did uh, prostatectomy uh, laparoscopically in dogs, a couple of them, and we decided it was going to be really hard to do a radical prostatectomy laparoscopically. And there was a general surgeon named Schusler who described the first set of uh, laparoscopic prostatectomy. He performed nine of them and said the average, thank you, <clears throat> the average uh, operating time was nine hours and that there was no advantage over uh, open surgery. Uh, and the, there was no, uh, there's no uh, obvious vision at that point that laparoscopic prostatectomy could be performed in a reasonable length of time. But then the French uh, team of Guillaume and Valencian uh, pioneered uh, laparoscopic prostatectomy in France and decreased those surgical times to about uh, three to four hours. And then the American experience in laparoscopic prostatectomy followed. And uh, I, I started to do laparoscopic prostatectomies in about, well, about maybe seven or eight years ago and did about 50 or 60 of them. And, and uh, they were you know, obviously a very challenging uh, procedure. And when the robot came about, we obviously converted to that. The Da Vinci system was uh, cleared for use in 2000 uh, for abdominal surgery primarily, and it was, uh, it was, <clears throat> it was originated uh, thinking that it would be used primarily in cardiac surgery. 
But when urologists got their hands on the Da Vinci surgical system and started to do prostatectomy, then we obviously became the most uh, highest volume users of robotic technology. And now it accounts for about 85% of all uh, radical prostatectomy in the United States. If you look at the progression, and this will, uh, we talked a little bit, I think, about this last night, you know, this might be a lot of uh, direct-to-consumer marketing and, and a lot of marketing by intuitive, but uh, the demand for radical prost or robotic prostatectomy in the United States has increased dramatically over the last, even the last short period of time of five, five years. In 2005, only 20% of uh, prostatectomies were done uh, robotically, and now it's almost completely reversed, so that 85% of prostatectomies in the United States are now done with uh, robotic uh, technology. Now, some have <coughs> called uh, robotic surgery into question, and this is one of the uh, articles that was published a, a couple of years ago using the SEER Medicare uh, database to look at uh, outcomes after uh, minimally invasive versus open prostatectomy. And this art article uh, sheds some light on the differences uh, looking at outcomes such as incontinence and erectile dysfunction. It also looked at perioperative uh, complication rates. And obviously, it was a retrospective look at uh, Medicare coding data, so it was nothing prospective or, or, or at a higher level of evidence. But what it suggested is, what the, is uh, that there was a high, higher risk of uh, incontinence and a higher risk of uh, erectile dysfunction after robotic or after, uh, yeah, after minimally invasive prostatectomy compared to open prostatectomy. Now, there are a lot of problems with this uh, study. One is that they lumped laparoscopic and robotic prostatectomy together. Two, it was, uh, it was looked at during a period of most uh, surgeons' learning curves. And three, they really didn't focus on some of the real advantages that were found with minimally invasive surgery, a much lower complication rate overall, a much lower uh, bladder neck contracture rate, lower pulmonary and cardiovascular complications, much shorter hospital stay about a third the risk of uh, requiring a blood transfusion. So there were a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of advantages to minimally invasive surgery that weren't focused on in this article, but the media took it, and, and this was a, a critique of uh, minimally invasive prostatectomy. So again, uh, robotic and minimally invasive prostatectomy has been called into question as well it uh, should. So let's look at some of the data. Is pain any different after open or robotic prostatectomy? Well, this is a series from uh, Vanderbilt, Jay Smith and his group, looking at 159 robotic uh, prostatectomies versus 154 open prostatectomy, and they used Toradol, Ketolorac, and they looked at uh, morphine equivalents for pain control, and they had patients rate their pain on a, on a 0 to 10 Likert scale. And what was found is that uh, uh, comparing robotic and uh, open prostatectomy, there was really no difference. The pain the day after surgery was slightly in favor of robotic uh, prostatectomy compared to open. But you can see from the numbers on this, uh, on this scale here that these are low numbers. It's a 10-point scale. So for both robotic and, and open prostatectomy, the pain after surgery is relatively low, and there was no real difference at any uh, point in time in, uh, in follow-up. What about length of hospital stay? Well, at Vanderbilt, you know, they've uh, designed these uh, patterns of care, clinical pathways for prostatectomy. And if you put a patient on a clinical pathway and tell them before surgery that they're going to be going home on postoperative day number one or two, they usually do, at least in the United States. I heard here it might be different when you pay for your own surgery. You get to maybe demand a little bit longer time in the hospital. But, but, uh, but the point with this uh, study was that there was no uh, real difference in the length of uh, stay after uh, a, a minimally invasive uh, prostatectomy. Now, what about hematologic outcomes, uh, blood loss with surgery? I think most, if not all, studies show that there truly is a difference in blood loss and discharge hematocrit after a minimally invasive or robotic prostatectomy. Now, uh, the naysayers will argue that it's not a clinically significant difference because if you don't increase the number of transfusions that you give, then it's, uh, it's not significant that blood loss is uh, somewhat, somewhat higher. And this is what uh, Van this uh, study here from Vanderbilt again showed as well. Uh, significant differences in post-op hematocrit and the change in hematocrit, but the transfusion rate was a little higher in open prostatectomy, but wasn't statistically significantly uh, different. But what is the importance of you know, a post-op post hematocrit after radical prostatectomy? This is uh, work uh, from uh, Herbal Poor in an uh, open prostatectomy set, uh, 537 open prostatectomies uh, done, uh, performed between uh, 2002 and 2005. And what was looked like in this study was returning to uh, part-time work, full-time work, and unlimited physical activity, so three endpoints here. And they measured this based on the discharge hematocrit. And again, in an open prostatectomy group, 
uh, a one unit increase in hematocrit decreased the time uh, to return to work and activity by 0.5 to 0.6 days. And it was consistent looking at part-time, full-time, or return to full activity, suggesting that the post-op hematocrit, the hematocrit that you leave the hospital with after a radical prostatectomy, is a strong predictor of when you return to full uh, physical activity. Now, what about quality of life? Is there any difference between quality of life uh, after prostatectomy uh, versus uh, versus uh, a robotic prostatectomy versus open prostatectomy. Well, this is the first study that actually identified that, and this was a series from the uh, uh, University of North Carolina, Raj uh, Pruthi's uh, group. And they looked at physical and mental health survey uh, uh, assessments using uh, validated uh, SF-12 form. And they questioned men who had prostatectomy both pre-op and then weekly during the first six weeks postoperatively. And what's interesting in this study is that, as most studies looking at quality of life after radical prostatectomy show, the mental score, the mental health uh, quality of life or mental quality of life increases after you've had your surgery, probably from decrease in anxiety. And the you know, surgery is over and now my cancer is gone. There's, there's better mental health. But the physical scores fall, as you would expect, and then recover over a period of, uh, of time. And if you compare... Uh, uh, robotic prostatectomy to open prostatectomy, there, it seemed that robotic prostatectomy patients recovered their physical quality of life uh, sooner after radical prostatectomy. And these were statistically significant differences in each of these weekly time points. Now, you could argue that <clears throat> by 6 and 12 weeks post-op, those lines, you know, merge, so what's the, what's the difference? But this study suggested that at least within the first six weeks, post-surgery, uh, there was uh, improved quality of life, physical quality of life, and more rapid recovery of quality of life after a robotic rather than an open prostatectomy. Now, what about visibility? This is Bob Myers. He was one of my mentors at the Mayo Clinic, and he always stressed in me the importance of using surgical loops during radical prostatectomy. Uh, and he did a very, very precise uh, uh, nerve sparing operation. And, you know, one of the potential advantages of robotic technology is the magnified uh, surgical field, uh, 10 times magnification with uh, three dimensions and high definition image. And if you, Bob Mar Myers uh, stressed this, he, he looked at uh, 500 consecutive radical prostatectomies of his own between 2004 and 2005. And uh, Bob uh, started with two times uh, magnification loops and then changed to 4.3 loops. And they looked at this positive margin range, particularly at the apex, with the different uh, loop magnifications. And in multivariate analysis in this series of 500 uh, patients undergoing prostatectomy, using the higher magnification loops improved his uh, positive margin rate. So uh, the overall positive margin rate and apical positive margin rate, again, suggesting that, uh, that improved and magnified uh, visibility at the time of surgery is important in limiting the uh, probability of positive surgical margins. This is data from uh, uh, Jay Smith and, and the group at Vanderbilt about the incidence of positive margins comparing both robotic and open prostatectomy. And what was found in this series, uh, looking at uh, about uh, 500, I believe, uh, surgical cases, was there was uh, it was actually lower with robotic prostatectomy. But they admitted that there was selection bias. Uh, men with higher risk disease underwent open prostatectomy. But it certainly didn't demonstrate, and this was early in the learning curve, it didn't demonstrate that the incidence of positive margins was higher with uh, robotic uh, prostatectomy. Now, there have been a lot of series that show a decrease in the uh, frequency of positive margins as you get up the learning curve. And I think, uh, you know, I would acknowledge that myself but in my own learning curve, that I think it's the, the probability of a positive margin is certainly higher in that first 50 to 100 cases that you do. Uh, but I think once you reach the top of that learning curve, I think uh, uh, there's no real difference, in my opinion in the instance of positive margins. What about urinary incontinence uh, recovery after surgical uh, treatment? I just show, show this slide. This is data from Jim Eastham, um, because this is a slide that demonstrates that surgical technique can improve time to recovery and total uh, number of men who recover their urinary incontinence after radical prostatectomy. This was an open prostatectomy series, and it did simple modifications of technique. In this case, it was just intussuscepting the bladder neck and preserving the pubic prostatics and a no-touch technique of the urethra. So simple modifications like that resulted in 
uh, a earlier time to recovery of continence after radical prostatectomy and an improve, uh, uh, improved overall probability of obtaining complete recovery of con uh, continence after the surgical uh, procedure. Some of the other things to consider are anatomic variability. And we know now, I think, uh, and that's, well, there's some, some question about this, that there are anatomic uh, considerations that we were unaware of at the time of prostatectomy that probably predict uh, recovery of continence. And uh, one that has been shown consistently in um, uh, analyses of both uh, MRI studies and some studies in which uh, uh, retrograde urethrograms have been done is the length uh, of the membranous uh, urethra is a predictor of the time to continence recovery and the overall probability of continence recovery after radical prostatectomy. And this was a study that demonstrated that, showing that if the, and this was MRI uh, uh, assessed, and this is a preoperative, uh, this is a preoperative image, but if you looked at uh, the postoperative membranous urethral length, and in this study it was, the cut point was at 13 millimeters, but if it was longer than 13 millimeters, you had a significantly more rapid return of continence after radical prostatectomy and a higher probability of getting to that uh, point. Uh, other anatomic considerations are the shape of the prostatic apex. And uh, what's interesting, and this is something that Bob, Bob Myers at uh, Mayo again uh, stresses uh, in all of the talks he gives about uh, prostatic shape and, and anatomy, that, that there's a lot of situations with the prostatic apex, the either anteriorly or posteriorly, there's overlap of the uh, urethral, uh, urethral stump. And if you transect this urethra, you know, too distal, perhaps that uh, limits uh, the recovery of uh, continence after radical prostatectomy. So if you look at anatomic uh, variability in the apex of the prostate, the apex of the prostate that was associated with better early return of continence was the apex that did not have any anterior or posterior overlap of that prostate, suggesting that preservation of urethral length and not accidentally, because of overlap, transecting it too distally might improve the uh, results with the uh, return of early continence after uh, uh, surgery. Uh, others have proposed urethral suspension and reconstructive type techniques. This is a data, this is a study that VIP Patel, uh, and VIP uh, does this, uh, this uh, sort of suspension stitch where he throws a, uh, almost a figure of eight stitch in the, in the periosteum of the uh, pubic, uh, of the back of the pubic bone. And uh, when he looked at his data, <coughs> comparing those with and without the suspension, he found a slight difference at three months. There was no difference at six months or 12 months in the overall continence rate. But uh, early continence appeared to be better uh, with the use of this anterior urethral suspension stitch. Um, the other technique that uh, I think a lot of us are, have, have gone to, and I've, I've been doing this Rocco posterior reconstruction for the last 100 cases or so, and I, I, I really like it. I, you know, I didn't like it at first because it took extra time and it was sort of, you know, distorted the anatomy, I thought, of the posterior uh, support structures. But, but this uh, Rocco reconstruction where the posterior fascial plate is uh, reconstructed uh, in my, and I haven't looked at this objectively yet, but I do believe that uh, 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 continence is, a, uh, is recovered quicker after this. Um, what, what, I, what, I, what I see is that this reconstruction sort of brings the urethra back up into the pelvis. It's like, uh, you know, when, if you do perineal pressure at the time of radical prostatectomy, and I often do, if you push that urethra up into the pelvis, uh, you, know, you can, with this Rocco stitch, you can actually do that without any uh, pressure on the perineum. So, and I've done some postoperative cystograms on these, uh, on these men as well. The urethra sits at a higher level in the pelvis if they've had this posterior reconstruction. And the theory is that by reconstructing that, reconstructing that posterior uh, plate, it, it, it creates a fulcrum on which that U-shaped uh, sphincter can act. And so it makes, uh, you know, theoretically to me, it makes sense that that could improve the uh, probability of, uh, or, the, or the time to recovery of continence after radical prostatectomy. And this is the original data from uh, Rocco that showed, showed improvement in uh, time to recovery of continence uh, at uh, both early endpoints and, and longer endpoints with the use of this posterior reconstruction technique. Now, what about nerve smearing? <clears throat> you know, there's a difference between, at least, between the way I used to do it open and the way that I do it robotically, meaning that with open prostatectomy, I would do a retrograde uh, release of the neurovascular bundle, and with uh, robotic prostatectomy, we would do this integrate release of the bundles. Uh, is there any difference? Is there any difference on, in the tension or the torque or stretch on the neurovascular bundles if you do it one way or the other? Uh, 
Um, and, and I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question, but we certainly are, um, you know, asking asking the question. Um, intrafascial versus uh, interfascial bundle release, and the uh, the uh, the difference here is whether or not you're between the prostatic fascia and the levator fascia, which would be the um, interfascial dissection, or whether you're right on the capsule of the prostate, meaning that you're inside the uh, the um, uh, prostatic uh, or, or the, the prostatic fascia, so between the prostatic fascia and the prostatic capsule. And I think it, it's very difficult, at least in my experience, very difficult, uh, and sometimes during the operation to know exactly where you are, but it's very obvious in some situations that you're right on the capsule of the prostate. And, and I tend to try to, th the way I try to think about it is that if somebody with a higher volume cancer on one side, I try to do an intra or an intrafascial dissection rather than an intrafascial dissection on that side, so I'm a little bit farther away from the capsule of the prostate. Now, the problem with an intrafascial dissection is, is that there's a potentially higher chance of positive margins because you're actually violating this. Uh, you're, you're between the prostatic fascia and the prostatic capsule, whereas with the interfascial dissection, theoretically, the prostatic fascia is maintained, so you're farther away from the edge of that cancer. And if you look at a prostatectomy specimen, then what you, uh, what you can see with interfascial is you have this uh, sort of the shiny uh, uh, fascial tissue that covers the surface of the prostate versus this sort of nude appearance to the side of the prostate with an intrafascial uh, dissection, which theoretically can increase your risk of positive uh, surgical margins. Now, I, you know, I, this is sort of an older video. Whoa. I thought I might just show, uh, show a little bit about what, what I've just been talking about. Again, this, this is a little bit dated. You can see by this instrument. I don't use this one anymore. I usually use the uh, monopolar bi or the uh, bipolar Maryland's or uh, a fenestrated bipolar device. But here's incision of the lateral prostatic uh, fascia that we're trying to get down uh, into, that, uh, into that plane. I usually start distal, and here's taking of the uh, prostatic pedicle on the right. And uh, my opinion is this pedicle has to be taken up pretty high, you know, because the neurovascular bundles can sort of loop up uh, into, into that to higher near the prostate at the prostatic base. So you want to take this. But one of the most challenging planes, for me at least, is that plane is identifying right here. I can't really point, but identifying at that uh, sort of base corner of the prostate where that actually plane is. Once you get down to the mid-prostate or even up to the upper prostate, the neurovascular bundle starts to fall off the prostate very, very uh, very, very easily and very, very readily. And here you can tell that we're in an intrafascial plane because that prostatic fascia right here is being peeled off the prostate, and I'm right on the prostatic capsule. So this would be a little bit dangerous in somebody that has higher risk or higher volume disease on that side, but a low risk a patient finding that plane between the uh, prostatic, uh, between the prostatic fascia and the prostatic capsule. And one of the things is that torque on the, on the bundle there that I just sort of pulled to the left. You've got to be very careful, I think, about that. And even your assistants that use the sucker here sometimes can overstretch that neurovascular bundle. So I always try to stress that uh, we should limit that uh, torque on the, on the neurovascular uh, bundles. Uh, one of the other things that I sometimes do, particularly if the neurovascular bundles are oozy, is this, uh, can't seem to get this to go. There we go. Uh, is that you know? Here's the here's the neurovascular bundles, and occasionally these bundles are sort of oozy. In this case, not uh, not too bad at all. But I, I use a little hemostatic uh, gauze, and what this does is it sort of makes me feel better. I, I keep the cautery away from the neurovascular bundles. And I usually put this gauze on there while I'm doing the posterior reconstruction, just to provide some hemostasis. And and what it does is sort of reminds me not to uh, to uh, cauterize uh, anywhere near the neurovascular bundle. And I sort of tuck this around the bundle to provide some uh, hemostasis there. Does this improve the probability of you know, developing a uh, pelvic hematoma postoperatively? I don't know. Uh, you know does it, does it uh, uh, in, in those oozy neurovascular bundles, does it cause, does it allow hemostasis then? Yes, I think, it, I think it's very useful for, for that. Um, but this is something that I've but done uh, occasionally when those bundles are, uh, are more uh, vascular. Now, what is the, there's been a lot of talk about the learning curve, and if you ask experienced uh, surgeons that have done both open and robotic prostatectomy, they will say that uh, there may be as many as 150 robotic cases before you start to have comparable results in terms of uh, 
positive margins, confidence, and other thing. And uh, 250 for uh, comfort and confidence uh, before you get up to you know to get up that uh, learning curve. And unfortunately, in the United States, at least, you know, urologists uh, in 2005, 80% of them performed fewer than 10 prostatectomies per year. So it's going to be hard to get up that learning curve if you're only performing 10, uh, 10 prostatectomies per year. And there's been a lot of uh, focus now on, on uh, you know, outcomes and, and surgeon volume as it predicts uh, outcomes after, uh, after a prostatectomy. Uh, so if you look at learning curves uh, according to positive margin rates, here's... Uh, uh, Vanderbilt series of 366 uh, men with uh, pathologic T2 disease, showing that uh, with experience you can decrease your positive margin rates from, you know, 30 percent to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, under 10 percent. Again, with with uh, with learning, with uh, with uh, improving uh, the uh, uh, visual cues and, and the sense of where that uh, edge of the prostate uh, might be. Uh, again, there's lots of uh, uh, lots of literature now that suggests that surgical uh, outcomes are related to surgical volumes. Uh, a lot of this data has come out of uh, Memorial, uh, looking at uh, all kinds of uh, outcome measures. This is a this is one of those uh, papers. Eric Klein uh, wrote this one, but uh, I think it was over 7,000 prostatectomies performed by 72 uh, surgeons, and they looked at uh, this was a cancer control outcome. So this was not looking at continence or potency. Uh, and what they, uh, what they found was uh, whether your cancer was low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. You know, if you look at where these learning curves plateau, it was around 250 cases. So suggesting that it takes 250 open prostatectomies to have to uh, be up the learning curve in terms of uh, providing good cancer control, negative margins, et cetera. And there was some, uh, you know, there's some uh, theory that, you know, low risk cancers would do well no matter who and no matter what the experience level is. And conversely, high-risk cancers would do poorly because they're pre-predictive, you know, to, to do poorly. But, but what this showed was that the learning curve can be demonstrated in any uh, risk level of uh, prostate cancer. Now, changing gears a bit, bit so again, uh, robotic surgery has gone beyond uh, prostatectomy and, and gone, uh, at least in urology, into the treatment of uh, renal masses and the treatment of uh, bladder cancer for or urological malignancies. And there are obvious advantage to nephron sparing approaches. We all know that. Uh, some, uh, fortunately, uh, nef unfortunately, nephron sparing surgery, at least in the United States, is underutilized. But there's lots of data now that suggests that there's less chance of chronic renal insufficiency with, uh, with uh, partial versus radical nephrectomy. There's actually studies that show quality of life advantages, believe it or not. So even if you have the same flank incision, you seem to have higher quality of life. If you had a prost if you had a, uh, a partial nephrectomy versus a radical nephrectomy, and then oncologic outcomes are uh, consistently shown to be equal between uh, partial nephrectomy and radical nephrectomy, even for tumors up to seven centimeters in size, uh, depending on how you select those tumors, the location of those tumors, obviously. Uh, but again, there's a concern about uh, whether partial nephrectomy or nephron sparing surgery is being applied as widely as it should. Uh, because it's a more challenging operation, and certainly a more challenging operation if done laparoscopically or robotically. So there's a sort of uh, emerging quality of care concern in the United States about whether these patients who would benefit from partial nephrectomy because they have a two centimeter renal mass are, are too often getting radical nephrectomy, and particularly when they're young. So uh, just, uh, just uh, something that is being discussed. Uh, now, I, I learned how to do robotic partial nephrectomy from Sam B. Diani from uh, Washington University, and this is some of his uh, diagrams. Um, use a, use a three-port or a four-port uh, technique. Uh, the, the fourth uh, port is the fourth arm, and sometimes it can get in the way. For, for those of you that have done robotic partial nephrectomies, uh, depending on the anatomy of the patient, uh, the fourth arm can sometimes compete with the other arms during that dissection. So, so what I've done during during the surgical procedure is sort of modify. I undock that fourth arm if it's starting to get in the way, and I just use that other port as another assistant port, and it works very well. But in many situations, that fourth arm really uh, assists in lifting the lower pole of the kidney to put the hilum on stretch and, and some other things during the laparoscopic procedure. And also, it can be used to fix the kidney in a in a fixed the kidney in place when you're actually doing the uh, uh, resection of the mass and the reconstruction. 
So I actually like to use the fourth arm if at all possible, but there are some situations where there's a lot of uh, competition between the fourth and the other arms during the uh, procedure. And the goal, obviously, is to decrease the warm ischemia time, and there are techniques that have been uh, devised to do that, and one of them is, is this technique, uh, the sort of sliding hemolytic clip technique, which we use. And we set up these uh, little uh, sutures, and we use this quick sliding technique, and it really has resulted in a, in a decrease in the warm ischemia time. And this is data that Sam uh, showed in his own series, looking at his ischemia times of as long as 40 minutes, which have been decreased to 15 minutes using these, these, little, uh, these little techniques. This is a patient. This is a patient from again older video from about three years ago, but it sort of illustrates, I think, what I'm what I'm talking about. This is a renal mass. It's a anterior, sitting though right on the surface of the hilum here, the renal vein here, and this is an anterior branch of the renal artery. And so uh, we we decided to pursue this uh, robotically, and and this is this is what it looks like. Here here's the hilum, uh, but here here's the uh, here's the vessels coming in, and this up here is this anterior place mass, which is sort of sitting right at the uh, crotch of the, uh, of the uh, kidney here. There's these little tiny vessels that come off, the, come off the artery and go into the parenchyma of the kidney here, which we can take. Now, I would never use, this, I would never use a clip like that now. Uh, I would just cauterize that little vessel, but in those days, I was a little bit more uh, cautious. Like here, we just cauterize that. But here, so here, and you can tell that the bulldogs, and we put bulldogs on the renal hilum, uh, uh, gone to uh, putting often two bulldogs on the renal artery because sometimes those bulldogs don't compress that artery well enough, and you get some oozing like like this, uh, like this case right here. Now this, you know, it's easy to deal with. You just use your sucker and you just kind of move along. And sometimes you can use cautery or argon to sort of help with uh, with some of that uh, bleeding. Here, here, I just do a little buzzing. And, and then all, that also, that's all it took to slow down some of that, to slow down some of that bleeding. But in many cases, if you get good control of the renal uh, hilum, you you uh, have very little oozing, and you're really operating in a in a nice uh, surgical field. And then here's the uh, here's these uh, the sliding hemolock type technique, and we've resected this mass uh, here, and we put these in. And here it's a hemolock clip with a lapper tie behind it and a knot behind that, and we quickly and not not so quickly here, obviously, but we quickly place these uh, place these sutures, and then on the other side we uh, we uh, fix them to the kidney parenchyma with with uh, another uh, hemolock clip. And here's here's a demonstration of that, where you put the clip about halfway down, you hold, and you can really slide and put a lot of tension on that, and you can really pull that uh, defect back together very very nicely in a very quick way. And here I don't know why I'm so concerned about how that thing uh, sits there, but but uh, but, and, and then you can put a lapertite above it, but we usually don't put the lapertites on until after we've compressed it uh, to the extent that we want. Now, after we get these clips on, we can unclamp, unclamp the hilum. So I, I'll unclamp the hilum right now and then cinch up these, uh, these uh, hemolock uh, clips. And what that does, is, again, it gives you another five minutes of uh, scheming time that you get to avoid by unclamping uh, early. And then you can just sort of cinch and re-cinch. And again, if you see, and here, here's, the, here's the defect here. And as we tighten these, uh, as we tighten these clips, we really cinch that back together very nicely and very tightly there. Occasionally we'll put a little uh, Evacel or Tisseal or something like that, some hemostatic agent in that defect if there's a little bit of ooze. And in some cases we'll just, after unclamping the hilum, we'll put another nice deep stitch there and do it, uh, do it another time. But it works very well uh, and it's a very quick way, if you pre-prepare those sutures, it's a very quick way to to get that uh, defect repaired very quickly and uh, limit the warm ischemia time. So what are the cri criticisms of robotic partial nephrectomy? Well, uh, you know, the biggest is that why not just do it laparoscopically? It's less expensive to do it laparoscopically. But, you know, I've done them laparoscopically, and I think it's much more difficult to do the reconstruction and creation of the angles to do these kinds of suture techniques. It's much more difficult at pure laparoscopically, at least in my hands. I'm not saying that uh, in experienced hands it would be any difference at all. Uh, the, other, the other critique is that you really have to have an experienced bedside assistant when you're doing robotic partial nephrectomy because the, robot, the bedside assistant is the one that puts the, takes the bulldogs on and off the renal hilum, and that can be pretty treacherous in somebody who's inexperienced. And then this whole uh, uh, lack of uh, tactile or haptic uh, feedback is uh, something, when, particularly when you're dissecting the renal hilum, that sometimes uh, can be a little uh, hairy. And then, obviously, the, uh, the cost. <coughs> what about cystectomy for bladder cancer? Well, I think it's growing in popularity uh, nationally, uh, I, and I think the jury is definitely still out on uh, this. 
but what I've seen in the in the cases that I've done is the there, there are the, the minimal invasive advantages. They're very comparable to robotic uh, prostatectomy in terms of blood loss and earlier return of uh, bowel activity and earlier discharge from the hospital, things like that. Uh, I haven't ventured into doing intercorporeal uh, urinary diversion to do it all extracorporeally through a small 8 centimeter uh, lower abdominal incision and then create the uh, neobladder and, and, and place it, neobladder or, or conduit uh, primarily. Uh, the biggest question with uh, robotic cystectomy is the question about the adequacy of a lymph node dissection. And I think that's where the learning curve really is in robotic cystectomy, is making sure that you're very comfortable doing an extended node dissection up to above the aortic uh, bifurcation and do that very comfortably around the iliac vessels. And, and that, uh, that takes some time to get real comfortable in doing a nice, complete uh, node dissection uh, with, uh, with a robotic cystectomy. Uh, the first 10 or 20 cases that I did, I felt like I wasn't doing as good of a lymph node dissection as I could do via an open approach. But again, like any learning curve, you get to the point where you feel like you're doing an equal node dissection. Uh, just to <coughs> look, just to talk a little bit about this, it, it's uh, exaggerated or not exaggerate, but full Trendelenburg uh, positions, just like uh, prostatectomy. The trocars are placed a little bit higher. Uh, instead of right above the umbilicus, we put the camera trocar a little bit higher in the abdomen. You can tell this is an older uh, video because we have these old uh, da Vinci uh, uh, trocars. Uh, and we put a 12-millimeter port both up and below. The reason we put 12 up here, we usually use a 5 here in prostatectomy if we need it. The reason we put a 12 up here is that we take the pedicles with the endo-GIA stabling devices, and you have to have a larger port to be able to get that in. And the angle to take the uh, posterior pedicles is much better from this angle than from that angle. So we use a 12 millimeter port up above. We create the diversion extracorporeally. This is an example of an ileal conduit. Uh, again, we make an 8 centimeter lower abdominal incision. It's very easy to pull the bowel up uh, to the abdominal wall and create the diversion. In fact, I think it's easier because the uh, fascia in the abdominal wall actually creates like a retraction device. You can actually pull the bowel up on the abdominal wall and you're not having to sort of constantly push all the other bowel out of the way. So it sits there, you bring the ureters up to the skin and you do a very simple uh, uh, bricker type uh, anastomosis to the conduit, push the bowel anastomosis back in and then create the conduit. And it's very, very quick and very, very easy. And I think actually easier than open when you're doing a conduit. The challenge is when you're doing a kneel bladder, and here's an example again, through the same kind of an incision, you bring just 65 centimeters of ileum up and uh, create a kneel bladder that we do the, uh, we do the studer, uh, discard the proximal five centimeters to allow better mobility of the, of the uh, kneel bladder, create the, uh, create the kneel bladder, and then, and then again, uh, with it sitting up on the abdominal wall, everything else back in the abdomen, do the ureteral uh, ileal anastomosis, and then the question is, how do you get it back down to the urethra? And uh, in the first uh, 10 or 20 cases or so, I was, uh, I was uh, closing the fascia, putting a patient back in Trimbellenburg, redock redocking the robot, doing the anastomosis. But I got uncomfortable with that, one, because it took a lot more time, two, because it's very difficult to sort of assess the tension on the anastomosis when you're dealing with the bowel. Uh, and I was, uh, I was concerned that there was more tension with the guy in that Trendelenburg position, so I, I got away from doing that. And I just I extend the incision a little bit to actually just put down the anastomotic sutures, and it just saves about an hour and a half of surgical time. And uh, have you know noticed a dramatic difference in their recovery. They still haven't had their be uh, uh, belly open for six hours, you know, exposing it to, to, the, uh, to the retractors and the lap sponges and the insensible losses and the blood loss and that sort of thing. So they still have a... Uh, shorter ileus, uh, in my experience, than 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 with open uh, uh, cystectomy, and this is really my my experience. This is through December, 72 cases. Um, the ileal condos take about five to six hours now. The kneel bladders, because of that sort of creating the kneel bladder and having to get it down, the osmosis take longer. Blood loss is like uh, prostatectomy, uh, you know, 100 cc's, 100 to 200 cc's or less. Um, earlier return, I think, of bowel activity. Now it's not. That's the case in every situation. Don't, I'm not trying to make that case. I, I do think the hospital stay, in my experience at least, is a little bit shorter, probably a day. 5.7 days is what we have been uh, averaging. I had one patient go home on post-operative day three and a lot go home on post-operative day four. And the lymph node count's about 24 so uh, right now, um, some much higher and some in the teens, but uh, mean about 24 lymph nodes. And the complications are relatively similar to the open uh, series. This was a prospective randomized trial done by Raj Pruthi at uh, North Carolina looking at open versus uh, robotic uh, cystectomy, trying to answer some of these questions about whether there was truly a difference. 
And their data suggested that, uh, as you would expect, that blood loss was less with uh, robotic prostatectomy. The time to flatus and the time to bowel movement was less with robotic uh, cystectomy. Um, operative time was longer robotically, as you would expect. Uh, and in this particular series, there was no difference in the uh, time in the hospital, the discharge uh, time from the hospital. Uh, but it did, did sort of uh, point out that there might be some advantage in terms of time to return of uh, uh, bowel activity uh, comparing the open and the robotic approach. What about cost? Something that we talk about both uh, for uh, prostatectomy but also uh, certainly for cystectomy. Again, looking at that same series from from uh, University of North Carolina, they tried to sort of assess the difference in cost between uh, open and uh, and uh, robotic uh, cystectomy. And they looked at OR costs, both those that are fixed, fixed costs were the base cost plus disposable instrumentation. Open were primarily the, the fixed cost open were the disposable staplers, uh, primarily about $2,000 uh, per case. And then for the robotic fixed costs were those plus the cost of the robot, you know, amortized over with, with the uh, maintenance costs sort of included in that as well. The variable costs were the length of uh, surgery costs, and then hospital costs uh, varied a little bit uh, in terms of transfusion rates and lengths of stay between the open and the, and, the, uh, and the robotic approach. And basically what was found, as you might expect, that if you consider, uh, you know, six hours of operative time, that, uh, and, and this, would, you know, this would impact anesthesia costs, that the, that the robotic was about $1,600 higher per case than the uh, open uh, cystectomy. And if you, wanted to, if you wanted cost equivalence in this particular model, you would say that, you would say that in, in open or an open cystectomy that leaves the hospital on day seven is equivalent to the cost of a robotic cystectomy that leaves the hospital on day five. So again, two, you'd have to save two days in the hospital to actually have equivalence of cost in that situation. There's no question that, just like radical prostatectomy, the cost of robotic uh, cystectomy is higher than open cystectomy. But when I present uh, this, some of this stuff to my uh, my hospital uh, administrators, they like they like this kind of stuff uh, because we have a set number of beds in our hospital, and we're always trying to fill them with new patients. So if I can get the, hosp if I can get the patient out of the hospital in a day, day earlier or, day, or two days earlier, you know, from a, from a hospital perspective, it's uh, better. And, you know, this is just my, this, again, this is not consistent, and I'm not trying to argue, you, you can certainly get an open prostatectomy home on the next day if you tell them that's what they need to do. There's no question. And certainly if you're doing perineal prostatectomies, you can probably get them home the same day. Uh, but this is what I, I would send opens home on the day of post up uh, the morning of post up day number two. All of the robotics, not all, 98% go home on post up day number one. And then I think there's a, a, a you know a day or so improved uh, stay in the hospital with cystectomy. And then we we obviously know there's difference between open uh, nephrectomy versus a, a robotic uh, partial nephrectomy, and then pyeloplasty as well. Pyeloplasties all go home, and I do a lot of pyeloplasties too. And they all go home the morning of the next day, and all feel all feel real uh, real good because uh, we're not making any kind of increased uh, you know incision in those uh, in those patients. Now, I just want to touch real briefly on uh, on teaching because I think this is a big challenge at the academic centers. How do we teach robotic surgery? And this is uh, this is me sitting with one of our residents at uh, University of Alabama, and this is what we would do in the past. I would sit here by the by the monitor here, and I would let the residents sort of do uh, little bits and pieces of the case and kind of sit by their side and kind of critique. And this obviously requires that there be somebody at the bedside doing the assistant uh, work. So in, in this case, um, it, was, it could either be another resident or in, and now I have a, a physician's assistant that actually assists at the bedside. Uh, but this is the old uh, way in which we would uh, teach. Now we, have a, now we have a Da Vinci SI, a dual console, where the resident can actually sit look in a console the same way I do. And we can we can flip back and forth between one uh, and the other. It's a very, it's a very useful teaching uh, tool, I think, uh, and it allows, uh, and the residents love it because uh, they don't have to be at the bedside all the time. They can actually get some uh, consult time. But, but it is, you know, and a lot of, uh, a lot I know when I was going through the learning curve, and a lot of uh, people are going through learning curves in, at uh, institutions around the country, it's very difficult to know um, you know, what, uh, to be able to determine what kind of experience on the console the resident can get until you're well up that learning curve. Now, this is some data from Howard uh, Winfield at uh, Iowa looking at their, uh, his first uh, robotics, and he sort of divided the case into nine segments and then incorporated fellows and 
resins into the, some console time during you know those nine uh, segments and looked at outcomes. And again, he was going through the learning curve at the same uh, time. And this case was divided again into those nine segments. You can see a, a wide variability in the time for each of those segments. And he noted that the biggest variability was in the anastomosis time during his initial uh, series. Uh, but uh, like I said, I don't have it here. But uh, what he showed is that you could that you could bring uh, fellows and residents into that sort of learning curve and actually not have too much variability in your operative uh, times. In contrast, this is data from uh, MD Anderson looking at training urologic oncology fellows. And, they've, and, and in this series, they divided into 11 different steps in the procedure. And they found that if you let the fellow do these uh, steps, it took, uh, the operation took 66 minutes longer. This is, a, this is a prostatectomy. So there was a clear, and this a graph that spells that out pretty nicely, the staff, the experienced up the learning curve uh, faculty member could do these steps uh, significantly more quickly than the fellow, uh, which sort of makes uh, sense. Here's the data actually from, from Howard uh, study showing that, you know, the attending physician, he, he would do these the first 15 cases primarily, but then the fellow had very, you know, similar surgical times for doing this. Is in, in this case, this is the bladder next step. And then later on in the learning curve is uh, incorporating the resident into that without really significant difference in, in where, that, uh, where that surgical time uh, lies. Uh, what about if you're past residency and you want to uh, establish robotic uh, surgical skills? This is data from Tom Erling at UC Irvine. He was an experienced open oncology cancer surgeon, obviously, uh, with no previous laparoscopic uh, experience. He took a da Vinci training course. He also did some cadaveric uh, laparoscopic prostatectomies and then started the practice of his uh, own. Obviously, he's become uh, you know, one of the highest volume robotic prostatectomy uh, surgeons in, in the country. Um, and I think it does a very, very nice uh, case. Uh, he, he found that it took him only about, uh, you know, 10 cases or so before he reached, quote, a four-hour proficiency, whatever that means. So time is not, you know, everything with uh, robotic prostatectomy. Uh, but he, he found that he could decrease his surgical times pretty quickly. Now, others have found that it takes significantly longer than 10 cases to get your surgical times down. But uh, this showed that a... Uh, uh, non-laparoscopically trained surgeon can actually do pretty well in getting those surgical times down. Um, there's a, this is uh, Elspeth uh, McDougall's uh, um, mini residency uh, program, which they established at UC Irvine, where uh, urologists uh, around the country could come and spend five days, a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. There's some animal uh, lab time. There's also some in inanimate time. And then they actually offered to follow up and do proctoring and mentoring at that particular uh, person's institution. They found that this worked very well, and questionnaire follow-ups to this suggested that it was a very good teaching tool. The problem with it, it was, I think, $5,000 to attend to attend this course. So, you know, it's great to, to have this thing, but if you can't, if you can't fund it, it's just like a lot of things in, in, in teaching, you know, simulators. It's great to have a simulator, but who can spend $100,000 for a simulator? So it's very difficult to sort of apply some of these uh, teaching tools to the general uh, urologic population. And what does the future hold? Well, there's a lot of, uh, you know, at the AOA last year, there were a ton of papers. I know at the AOA this year is going to be a ton of papers about notes and less uh, natural orifice, uh, transluminal endoscopic uh, surgery notes where you're accessing, you know, do, doing all the things we were taught not to do. <laughs> so, you know, if you ever, you know, if anybody ever told me you, you should put a hole through the colon to get to the peritoneal cavity uh, to do an operation, you think, you know, you're crazy. What are you, what are you thinking? But uh, they're doing this for for kidney surgery, gallbladder surgery, and other kinds of uh, surgery now. And I think urology is sort of trying to find its own application for this because it's a little bit different because we're operating on the kidney, which is in the retroperitoneum. For maybe intraperitoneal operations, it makes more sense. And there's lots of unique challenges to notes, you know, a lot of issues with uh, instrument classing. If you're going through a single uh, orifice, how do you get... How do you get the triangulation that you need to actually be able to accomplish uh, the operation? But there have been reports of single site. This is less laparoendoscopic single site surgery or less surgery. And this is a report from Cleveland uh, uh, Clinic uh, describing a, uh, a single port uh, pyeloplasty. And again, these are just examples. There are lots of uh, case descriptions now in, either, in even small case series describing single site uh, pyeloplasty and attempts at single site uh, simple nephrectomies and that kinds of thing. And I think, again, as the technology uh, progresses, and this is some of the robotic instrumentation that are being developed to accomplish single-site surgery. So if you could actually put a, put a device through a single uh, orifice and then deploy it so that you can recreate triangulation intraperitoneally, 
then you have a real deal. See, the problem now is you're going through a hole and you're competing. The other thing that Da Vinci is de designing is a is a reverse is a, is a if you put if you put instrumentation through a single hole, if you can get triangulation and you can use the computer technology of the robot to actually you know tell yourself that the right hand is the left hand, so you're actually triangulated within the within the patient. Uh, then you might be able to perform these much more easily because you create that space between your left and your right uh, hand. And this is technology that's in the process of being developed, but I think once this uh, gets uh, uh, ready for prime time, it's going to be much easier to do this uh, limited, uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery. So what can we conclude? Well, robotic surgery for prostate cancer, uh, I think, really has become the uh, standard of care. I, I don't think, I'm not, and I never make the argument that it should replace open prostatectomy done and experienced and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, high volume hands. Uh, never make that argument because I know the operation can be done both both ways. But I, I certainly, we certainly can't deny that at least in the United States, you know, everybody wants a robotic prostatectomy, and and uh, uh, you know, newer newer studies are I, I think demonstrating uh, some potential advantages. Partial nephrectomy and radical nephrectomy are gaining hold as well, or radical cystectomy. Uh, cystectomy is. Is, I think in its infancy, but I think uh, there's a lot of interest and a lot of popularity now uh, uh, going forward with uh, cystectomy. Do the costs justify the early outcomes? Is it making, if you can, uh, is it more, much more expensive to improve quality of life in the first six weeks after a surgical procedure? I don't, I don't know. A further discussion, obviously, on that. Lots of training and credentialing challenges. We've been going through this at our own institution. How do we know that somebody is competent to perform robotic surgery? Uh, particularly for newer type procedures, and this is going to be a continued challenge. Uh, technology, as I described earlier, I think will advance the field significantly over the next five or ten years, and the new frontier, the minimally invasive for lateral endoscopic single site surgery and the nose surgery, I think will, will also uh, develop. So I think, I think the future of uh, robotic surgery is, uh, is, is here, uh, and I think it's uh, here to stay, um, and uh, you know, we'll, see what, uh, we'll see what happens. Thanks for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you.